All right, I'll go ahead and get started since uh, I have quite a few slides to get through. Um, so um, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, uh, I'm Wes Chow. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the D digital hearth, which is a, a, a device that the research group and the nonprofit that I'm in has been designing to facilitate uh, group conversations. Um, this is probably going to be a little bit one of the, the more unusual talks here at the conference. Uh, you can turn off your technical brain for about 10 minutes, and then we'll actually start to dive into some, some details on, on, on how the thing works. Um, I'm honestly not sure why the conference uh, accepted my, my proposal, but here we are. Um, so I work for a nonprofit called Cortico, which is uh, closely attached to one of the research labs inside of the, uh, the MIT Media Lab, uh, the Lab for Social Machines. It's kind of a mouthful, sorry. Um, we, uh, we are a, a kind of deployment arm for the research that, that's inside of social machines. So first, I'll give an overview of um, the goals of this project, and then I'll, I'll go into the details of how this thing works. Um, OK. Sorry. All right. I am not able to advance slides. Give me a sec. There we go. OK. So, uh, so my boss is Deb Roy, uh, who runs the research group as well as a nonprofit. Um, he is the former chief media scientist of Twitter. And so a lot of his, um, uh, his old research was around the characteristics of online discourse, uh, particularly on Twitter. And I have this uh, secret theory that he was tired of people asking him to think about online toxicity. And so he pivoted to uh, a thing that was uh, completely opposite of what you might be able to do online. Um, so the question there was, um, is there some kind of a social medium that might be uh, more representative of, of ground truth than what you see on Twitter and Facebook? Uh, this book was going around the lab at the time, and it was starting to, um, to kind of catch in people's minds. This is The Politics of Resentment by Kathy Kramer. Um, Kathy is a, is a researcher at the University of Wisconsin, and what she did was, um, for something like, uh, I, I think like 10 years, she drove around Wisconsin inserting herself into uh, conversations, into the, these, these things that she called coffee clatches, which is basically a group of people that were naturally congregating, um, and, you know, and she, she, she would go in and ask um, kind of very uh, uh, passively directed questions. So w one example from the book is that there was this group of, of men who were, um, who had been getting together for something like 10 years to grab coffee uh, at a gas station before going into work. So, you know, so she went into these communities and found, found those people. Um, she, the, the, the tail end of her field work uh, overlapped with the Scott Walker recall vote, um, which if you remember, so uh, Scott Walker was a, um, a conservative uh, union busting governor of Wisconsin. And um, the teachers union in particular in, uh, in Madison uh, was not particularly happy with him. And uh, they garnered enough public support to, um, uh, to start a recall vote to get him kicked out of office. Um, and it was widely reported in the media at the time that he would probably be kicked out. Um, surprise, surprise, he was not kicked out. Uh, and Kathy actually um, didn't believe that he would uh, be kicked out based off of the conversations that she was having with people in rural Wisconsin. So they're kind of um, you know, shades of, of what, what you hear people like Peter Thiel talking about right now, where there's, um, you know, there's this notion of uh, preference falsification, which is that what people reveal sort of publicly in surveys is not uh, what they actually r reveal if you talk to them in person. So, uh, so we started thinking about Kathy's work, and we, we wanted to figure out a way to scale her work up. And so we started on, on the Local Voices network, network, or LVN. So um, LVN is centered around facilitated conversations with the intent to surface diverse and uh, underheard voices. Uh, to do it at scale, um, we need more than one Kathy. Uh, uh, ideally, we'd be able to uh, very cheaply scale out Kathy. We can't have her spawn lots of copies of herself, so we had to turn to, to, to technology to do this. Um, so we use hardware to help us with the collection of data. Um, but uh, since, since these are conversations with people, we also need to have a, a, a good way of pulling in participants. So we have a, a, a network that we've, we've kind of layered on top of this um, 
the large, uh, is a large volunteer network. And the idea with it is that it, it kind of sustains the, the, uh, uh, the growth of the data collection. Um, our uh, future interest is going to lie in the strength of this network. Um, and we think that it's, it, it will be the basis for connecting communities and for crossing so social boundaries. And I'll give you an idea of how that happens uh, uh, later in the talk. Um, finally, uh, so we, we, we'd like for LVN to have a real uh, outcome in the world. Um, this is the reason why Cortico exists. It's because, because we can set up Cortico so that the, uh, uh, as, an, as an institution, its metrics of success um, are not things like papers published, um, which is what, you know, what the lab's metrics are. Um, so uh, Cortico, um, uh, through, through LVN then, sets up this channel for, for policymakers and, uh, and journalists to get a better idea of what people are, are talking about in their communities. So policymakers and journalists right now are target users. So our, our very first experiment was in uh, it was in Mott Haven in the Bronx in New York. Um, so this is this is like our alpha. Um, so uh, Mott Haven is the poorest congressional district in the U.S. Um, we put out flyers uh, like this to get people to come in. We also uh, I, I believe we published this in the was it in the Mott Haven Herald, um, so so the local newspaper, um, and you know. Over the course of a couple of days, we had just, just a, a you know, steady stream of people coming in and talking to us. Um, this is uh, the, the very first version of our thing, or the, the, the alpha of it. We called it at the time the conversation box. And it was designed for, uh, for conversations with just one person, like more, more of like an interview style thing. Uh, what this thing actually is, is just a wood box around a tablet. Um, it was kind of the fastest way for us to, to, get, to get something going. Um, uh, you know, being a bunch of engineers at MIT, we still, of course, had, had, some, had some issues and things, things actually caught fire because uh, we deployed this thing in the summer um, in New York and it was getting to, uh, I, think it was, I think it was over 100 degree uh, days and there were no ventilation holes in the box. So um, we, we learned our lesson. In future versions, any time that we like kind of smelled smoke or thought that something was on fire, that was, that was our, first, our first thought is that we need more, more holes in the enclosure. Um, uh, this is Max Resnick. Uh, at the time, he was a student, and he ran a lot of the conversations for us. Now he's a full-time employee of Cortico. Um, so what kind of questions do we ask? Um, uh, what do you like uh, most about your community? Uh, what do you like least about your community? Um, and in Mott Haven, um, the responses to, to this question was actually uh, surprisingly unified. Um, people uh, talked a lot about the d diversity in the, in the population there. Um, you know, that's what they loved about it. Uh, what they were all concerned about actually was gang violence. Um, so as we were uh, getting all of this audio, we were showing this around to various people, to some potential donors, and one, one, uh, one donor said that he actually knew that the NYPD was planning on defunding the gang violence unit. And so this, this, we kind of latched onto this as like a, you know, like a piece of evidence that it's possible for these conversations to, to maybe surface some views that weren't quite obvious. Um, but still, these conversations were isolated, and they were one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so how um, we turn our attention to trying to figure out how we would bridge people and how we would try to get people talking to each other. So this is uh, version one of our, of our group system, our group conversation system. So um, these, uh, these conversations were, they're, they're still facilitator directed. So there's a, a person who's trained, trained in how to use the equipment and the person asks the kind of passive style questions that I just showed in the last slide. Um, the conversations included, um, they include typically between four to six participants, uh, and they're quite long. They're about an hour and a half long. Um, the, uh, uh, the conversations are, uh, well, so the, the, the hearth has to work kind of uh, in an offline way for, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, so that, that, you know, that informed the design, and I'll talk about that later. And there's also um, a highlights system uh, that we built into the interface, and I'll talk about that later as well. So, so this is version one of the hearth. Um, one of, of the, uh, the principles in the design was that it had to be uh, a very human object. Um, and we have found that, that the quality of the conversation is different when you have people sitting around something like this like, versus something that might be, you know, uh, that looks more like an Echo or like a Google Home. Um, so it's, it's, a, 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 it's, it's completely solid wood. Um, you know, it's, very, uh, it's, it's, it's nice and hefty. Uh, there's a soft speaker grill on the top of it. And then there's this LED ring that serves as a, as a state 
uh, kind of state indicator for, for the hearth. When it's recording, it's orange, and people actually stare at it um, in the same way that when people are sitting around a fireplace, they stare at the fire and talk, just kind of talk to, 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 to the whole group in that way. Um, so Kathy uh, Kramer, she came on as an advisor to Cortigo and, and, and is doing her uh, a sabbatical in the lab group. Um, and we, uh, we deployed our first set of hearts, about a dozen of them, uh, in, into Madison, Wisconsin in January. Um, why Madison? Well, because of Kathy. Um, she has uh, very strong connections to people, uh, to, to the community there and people there. Um, but also, at the time, uh, they were in the process of electing a new mayor. Um, so we went in in January. I believe the, February, uh, the, uh, the primaries were in February, and then the actual election was in April. So there were about, um, I think there were uh, something like eight candidates when we first went in, and, and uh, half of them had access to the LVN data. Um, and then of the, the, the two final candidates, one had access to the LVN data, and that was the person who, uh, who won. Um, we also gave access t to uh, journalists in the area. So the Cap Times is a local newspaper there, and so they wrote some, some pieces using the LVN data. Um, we partnered closely with the Madison Public Library for distribution and kind of keeping track of the hearth. Um, as a long-term strategy, this is a thing that we've talked about a lot, is trying to put these things into libraries. Uh, there's approximately one library for every 10,000 people in the U.S., so it's a, you know, it's a good kind of a, kind of a vector for, you know, for distribution. Um, and so these hearths are still running now. Um, at, at this point, we've accumulated several hundred hours of, of, um, of speech. Okay. Um, so enough of the mushy human stuff. Uh, I'll talk about the cold hard tech now. Um, so this is uh, V1 of the hearth. Uh, when it's in this state, we actually call this open hearth surgery. Um, at, at the core of it is, uh, is a small raspberry pie, uh, uh, and, you know, which, which, which serves as, as a place where we kind of uh, uh, centralize all the complexity in the system. Uh, there's a speaker in the middle of it, and the speaker is used for highlight playback, and I'll talk a bit more, more about that later. Um, uh, there's the LED ring that I, I, I mentioned before. Um, the hearth itself uh, doesn't have a whole lot of controls on it, so we use a, an iPhone that's paired with the hearth um, to, uh, to actually start, start and stop playback and stuff. Um, and then, um, you, uh, you know, you know, like again, like, like it has like, uh, the, the entire feel of it is like much more substantial and human than, um, you know, than the consumer devices that you're probably used to seeing. Um, so uh, version one was uh, solid wood. Um, we uh, encountered some issues with solid, with, with solid wood, namely it swells. Um, and we also didn't really plan properly um, the, uh, the amount of tolerance that we might need in, uh, in the screw holes. So within a day or two after assembling uh, these hearts, it became impossible to actually pull the pie out. Um, so our, uh, you know, our yield here wasn't, you know, wasn't great, but we did get a good, you know, good number of hearts out. Um, so this is version 1.1. 1. 1. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of internal plywood structure, which is much more tolerant to, you know, to, uh, uh, to things like humidity. And then the outside of the hearth is a wood veneer. Um, you actually can't tell, like, if, if you're just to uh, 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 just to look at it from, you know, from a couple feet away, you can't tell. You would have to pick up uh, the 1.1 1. 1 hearth and actually examine, like, the kind of wood seam lines to be able to tell that it's not the same as the first, the first set. These are the uh, custom PCBs that we had um, printed. Uh, so this, this deals uh, with the power circuitry and, and the microphone array that's in the hearth. Um, and I'll go into that in a bit. This is our assembly room in the Cambridge Innovation Center, which is a co-working space in Boston. Um, it, the, uh, uh, this office is actually it's at the intersection of two hallways. So people are always kind of peering in and kind of wondering what's going on because most of the uh, of, of, of the, um, you know, the companies in this space are just people staring at monitors. <laughs> um, this is where we test all of our components and try out different um, kinds of hardware and configurations. Uh, this is our Canadian team member who's curling the hearth. Um, if you can't tell, this is actually fake news. Um, we, were, uh, we were actually concerned about air travel and security, so we had the Canadians on the team go first. Um, we, uh, the, um, the, the, the hearths themselves have a, um, have a switch that completely cuts the power off just in case there is some, some kind of a battery issue. So 
you know, uh, so as a safety mechanism, we have that in place. And um, uh, if people at the if, if the, if the TSA at the airport ever um, ever asks what the thing is, we just say that it's a speaker. And yeah, like it seems, it seems like that could be plausible. Um, okay, so how do we control the thing? Um, so we, we have this, uh, all, each, each hearth is paired with, with an iPhone and there's an app on it that, um, uh, that, um, that controls all the activity on the hearth. Um, the, the app updates uh, are tied to deploys on the Pi. Um, I'll explain how that's done in a bit. Um, and the, uh, the connectivity, um, so we, we tried a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that we tried actually was for, uh, for the iPhone app to, to talk to the hearth over Bluetooth. Um, we had some issues with this. Um, the, uh, the app itself, uh, some of the request payloads are quite big, and the app itself is actually quite big, and it, it, it loads off the, off the Pi when it first starts up. So we were seeing latencies that were kind of unacceptable for, uh, for interactive use. Um, also, just, just uh, trying to issue play and pause commands, like you expect, um, you expect it to, you know, you know, the, the heart to respond pretty quickly, and we weren't able to get like a good latency from it. Um, so our next try actually was we, we put a secondary Wi-Fi uh, uh, dongle, it's, it's plugged into the USB ports in the Pi, like inside of the heart. So, so the, the, uh, the Pi has two, uh, two Wi-Fi interfaces. And we have a medium post um, where we go into all the details of the configuration of the, you know, the operating system, it's Raspbian, and you know, how we pulled this off. Um, so the Pi has two, two, two Wi-Fi interfaces. Uh, one goes to the public Wi-Fi, um, and, and the second one is, is private, and it broadcasts a unique SSID. So in this case, uh, you know, HearthNet 5 corresponds to one hearth. Um, and so when you start up the, um, uh, the phone, you just, you just pick the SSID that you want that phone um, to, uh, to, you know, like which hearth that, that you would like that phone to, to, to control. And so that's how you pair it. Um, the phone makes uh, API calls to a web server uh, that's on the Pi that's, that's bound the pi.local address. Um, the Pi runs, uh, runs a zero-conf uh, daemon, so pi.local resolves correctly when the phone connects, um, and the Pi also serves as a DNS server for, for the phone. Um, and the phone um, uh, talks, talks over the private Wi-Fi to the web server. Um, so the phone can issue these uh, 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 these API calls to the Pi uh, to control the the um, uh, the playback and the recording hardware. Um, the uh, the phone app can also configure the Pi's Wi-Fi. So this is how we get get the entire thing on onto the internet. It can it can pass through um, you know password and everything. Um, and then once the Pi gets on the internet, it sets up IP forwarding. So the Pi itself actually acts as a gateway for the phone. And so that's how the phone can do uh, can do iOS. Uh, updates. Um, as a side effect, um, uh, this allows us to get through login pages. So like if we're on a network that requires you to, you know, to accept a, a you know, TOS, um, since the, the IP traffic is just passing through to the phone, we can actually see, uh, see the terms of service on the phone, say yes there, and then, um, uh, but since, since, since the packets are passing through the Pi, um, the MAC address that, um, uh, that the pi public router um, keys on is actually the Pi's and not the phones. Uh, the hearth is um, stored inside of the Madison Public Library system, uh, which serves as a home base. Uh, so these are um, our codes on the hearths. Um, so they're, they're actually part of the circulation where they're checked in and checked out. Um, when they're checked in and in a library, on the library's Wi-Fi, then uh, the Pi will, um, will sync stuff uh, to and from our servers. Um, so uh, offline operation. So oftentimes the hearths are, are used in environments where there isn't um, easy access to power or to Wi-Fi. Um, so we had to build this into the design of the thing. Um, you know, so for, in for instance here, this is a short stack eatery, uh, which is uh, supposedly the best pancake house in Madison. Um, you can notice the, the drink on top of the hearth. Uh, we didn't plan for people to actually put, put uh, any kind of locus on the hearth. Uh, we're lucky we haven't had any, um, any accidents. Can't plan for everything. Um, since the Pi has to run offline, um, it needs a nice big battery. Um, the, the Pi consumes typically between 500 and 1,000 milliamps of power. And this, this is a stupid big uh, USB battery pack. It's, 26,000 milliamps. Um, so we get about uh, you know, one to two days of continuous operation here. Um, we, we don't ever run the thing for that long. Um, 
So, so there's a microcontroller that's in the PCB that provides power to the Pi, and it also listens for power button on-off on events. Um, and, the, and the micro needs a tiny amount of power uh, for, it to, for it to run. One of the issues that we encountered actually is that if the, um, uh, if the USB battery, I guess as a, maybe a safety mechanism or something, but if the USB battery doesn't detect a, a power draw above some threshold, it just completely cuts power off. And so the micro was underneath this threshold. So what we did was um, we set the micro up. So there's, there's, a, 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 there's an, a, an LED that's internal to, to the hearth that the micro cycles on and off and that consumes just enough power to keep the USB battery uh, going. So this, um, when everything is operating correctly, this actually extends our runway to about a month if the, if the Pi is powered down but the micro is on. Uh, our next version of the hearth will have much more um, uh, well thought out power circuitry. Okay, um, so how do we do software updates? Um, so uh, the, the iPhone app uh, itself is updated through the, uh, the app store, um, but we actually don't push updates to the app very often. Um, we use a framework called Apache Cord Cordova, which is, it, it was formerly called PhoneGap. So it's basically, it's a, it's a way for you to write a JavaScript application that has access to the native um, uh, controls of the phone um, through a web browser. So, so essentially, the app itself is just, um, uh, is just a web browser that d d doesn't have any of, you know, of the navigation um, uh, controls on it, and then it runs your, your, uh, your JavaScript application as if it was a web, uh, you know, just a normal website. Um, so we host the JavaScript on the Pi. So when the app starts up, it's configured to grab the current version of the control app uh, from the Pi. And so in this way, we can sync the updates uh, for, for, the, for the iPhone control device and the, uh, and the software that's on the Pi, like in, you know, uh, all in one deploy. Uh, we have a version database, so we keep track of, of um, uh, which versions of what software is running on, on, um, on, on each hearth. Uh, and we, we um, push the updates out through, uh, uh, through Ansible. Um, now, a typical Ansible run assumes that your, uh, your hosts are actually online, but in our case, our, our, our hosts are usually offline. And so we, we came up with kind of an, uh, 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 you know, like an async update um, a system where when, when the hearts come online, they check to make sure that they have the, um, uh, the correct version of, the, of their source code. Um, if, uh, if there's a version uh, uh, difference, then they'll download the new version of the source code, which contains a bunch of Ansible files in it, and then they'll run Ansible locally. So that's, that's, that's how we keep these things, um, you know, these things up to date and in sync. Um, we have a monitoring system, so we know which version every hearth is at, uh, when was the last time that it was upline, and so on and so forth. All right, um, so the microarray. Um, so this thing uh, has eight microphones in it. Um, the, the diameter is somewhere, not, probably not quite a foot and a half or so. Um, we use uh, MEMS mics. They're pretty good for this purpose. Um, and the, uh, the Pi uh, gets, gets the audio data from the mics over the GPIO pins. Um, um, and, uh, and since there are eight mics, we get eight channels of audio. And eight channels of audio is actually uh, quite a lot of audio to be sending over GPIO. Um, so we had to invent a kind of interleaving scheme. Um, so we take these, these, these eight channels, and you know, what we do is we, um, uh, we bring them down from 32-bit samples to 18-bit samples. And then we sample at a 16 kilohertz rate. Um, uh, after all that, uh, after all that, Reduction, we can then stuff that into two channels of 48 kilohertz 32 bit um, samples. And so what the, um, what the Pi sees actually is two, is two channel audio that is completely nonsensical. There are actually eight channels of data that are stuffed into two channels. Um, and, 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 and the way that we stuff those, those, uh, those eight channels in is with this scheme. So, um, so here, here, uh, here are eight, uh, eight words. And so uh, I'm not sure you can tell. The, the first kind of row of colors is this dark red. So that's, that's the first sample from, from the first channel. So it's, uh, it should be 18 bits. And then there are 16 bits of channel markers. So the channel markers all start with 010. And then the last three bits um, uh, show which, which channel number the previous sample was from. So 000 is the first channel. Um, the next color is pink. There are 18 bits for a sample there. Channel marker starting 010 and then 001, which says, hey, this is channel two. Um, 
Uh, and so um, the, uh, the Pi grabs all of this. Um, in various places downstream, we will deinterleave this and convert these files. We call these .ca1 files. We'll uh, convert them into, into A-channel WAV files for processing. Um, and we were initially doing this in Python, uh, but Python uh, kind of proved to be too slow, so we, we, we converted it into, um, uh, we actually use NumPy, and so we, uh, we rewrote some of the core code to use vectorized math, in which case it was fast enough, but um, we, we had some, uh, some issues with the Pi kind of losing uh, a few bits here and there, um, or like partial words, um, which would kind of shift the entire bit stream over, and, you know, and then the vectorized math wouldn't, wouldn't work very well. Um, so in the end, uh, we just, we just uh, bit the bullet and wrote the entire thing in C. Um, so now it's much faster, it's, it's, it's much more robust to failures. This audio is then uh, posted into our pipeline. Um, okay, so here's our processing pipeline. Uh, I'll just run through these steps and then, and then I have slides on each one of them that go into details. Um, so, uh, so, so we take these .ca1 files and we asynchronously upload while, while they're docked at the library. Uh, by async here, I just mean that, um, that the audio gets sent not when the audio is, is finished recording, but when, when the hearth goes back online. Um, so, so we push this audio uh, from the library to our servers. Um, the first, first thing that we do is we, uh, 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 we normalize the audio levels, um, and then we send it to, uh, to two different transcription services. One is human-based, and one is the Google API. We also have a third one that's, that's based off of our own stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but it's, um, it's, it's currently not really in production for, uh, for the hearths. Um, then we, uh, when, when the audio comes back, we do, we do some metrics uh, calculations. Uh, we calculate top terms. Top terms are kind of, um, it's kind of like a t topic modeling thing that we, that we show in the interface. Um, and then we do a thing called topic indexing, which, you know, which I'll show some, uh, some, some, um, uh, uh, some examples of that. Um, so each one of these things is a distinct step step in the pipeline. Um, we're not very cohesive about how we string these things together. So in some cases, uh, the, uh, the, the, the phase is triggered through, um, you know, through job queue, through, uh, uh, we use Rabbit internally. Um, we have a, like, a, like a slightly older uh, queuing system that's based off of Google watermarks in, um, uh, uh, from, uh, from Millwheel, I think. Um, uh, and then we also, in some cases, use S3 triggers. Um, we we like to make this all like one cohesive thing, but uh, you know, uh, maybe sometime in the future. Um, okay, so this is the raw uh, raw audio on the left, and then the range compressed audio on the right. So you can see the um, uh, the raw audio is actually quite low. Um, it's not that that we're not really picking up the audio well. It's just it's it, it's actually that the these mics are quite sensitive. Um, so so they're actually uh, they actually do a pretty good job. Um, right, so we normalize it. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's range compressed mostly for human consumption. When we send the audio to the transcription service, um, uh, the humans have to be able to hear it. Um, speech to text systems uh, like Google's API will typically do their own kind of range compression. Um, so, uh, right, so we use two transcription services. Uh, one is Rev. Uh, uh, which is humans, and the other is Google API. Um, Rev is fairly accurate, but it's very expensive. It's about 30 times as expensive as a Google API. Um, Google is, of course, less accurate, but it's dirt cheap. So what we do is we, uh, we run the translations through Google first, and we show those transcripts, and there's like a little thing that says, hey, you know, uh, uh, come back here for, for higher quality transcripts. Rev usually gets uh, their version of the transcripts to us um, between a couple of hours and 24 hours. Um, one kind of an interesting technical problem here actually is that Rev gives us the transcripts with um, time alignments uh, on speaker turns. So like when a person starts speaking, Rev says, oh, right now it's, uh, you know, I think that says one minute and four, 14 seconds in or something. Um, but in our interface, we allow the user to click on a word and have the audio jump to, uh, to where that word is, regardless of if that word is the start of a speaker turn. So we have a system um, that, uh, that does some sort of light speech to text um, on that, and then uh, we'll take the rev, uh, uh, the rev supplied alignments and, and, and align uh, those, those word boundaries to the transcripts. Um, so in, in addition to these two transcription services, we're also working on improving our own internal thing, which is based off of an open source framework called Caldi. 
Um, and that's a setup that we, um, that we built from, from a different project where, where we're transcribing about 3,000 hours of talk radio per day. And we've been doing that for about a year and a half. Um, uh, at that rate of transcription, it would be prohibitively costly to even use Google. So after these conversations are transcribed, uh, we run some analysis to characterize the speech. Um, so, so, we, so we look at things like, like the speed of the dialogue, uh, words per hour, um, uh, how, how long are, you know, are each of the speaker turns, um, mean interspeaking silence, I guess, is, is, uh, is, is how, how awkward the conversation is, how awkwardly silent it is. Um, Turn-taking balance is neat. So this is an information theoretic measure of, of, um, of like how spread out is, is, is a speech in, the convers uh, in, in this conversation. So if, if one person uh, speaks for 99% of the time and then everyone else kind of uh, takes turns for the last 1%, that value actually is very close to zero. Whereas if every single participant speaks for the same amount of time, then, the, then, uh, then that value is very close to one. Um, yeah, so there's an interruption rate. Uh, the matter lexical diversity is a measure of how many unique words there are um, from a, you know, I think a sample of a thousand words. Um, uh, and then mean word length, uh, 4.38 words. Conversations love to have four letter words. Um, so, oh, and then the, uh, the, the, so this very last metric is actually an important one. So that's, that's the speech to text uh, uh, transcriber's word error rate. Um, and we do some, uh, some research on speech errors and bias in particular. Um, so we, can, we actually run, run the audio through, uh, through gender classification. So we know, for instance, what the, what the, uh, uh, what the ASR error rate is uh, on, a, on a gender breakdown, um, as well as geography in the case of talk radio data. And we, we believe that geography is a good proxy for accents. And so, so there, um, we have some papers coming out that, that show that, in, you know, uh, that indeed a system like, you know, like the Google API does have, uh, have a bias against um, you know, certain ethnic groups. Uh, so we calculate top terms, um, which uh, roughly correspond to the topics of speech uh, during the conversation, and then we link them into the parts of the conversation that are about those terms. Um, so these, these terms, these are uh, TFIDF computed terms, so basically unusually frequent terms, but they're filtered down by uh, the topic indexing phase, which I'll talk about in the next um, slide. Uh, this, this interface is actually a primary um, method of discovery for users of the site. Uh, Topic indexing. Um, so this is a curated um, set of things that we care about that we like to track in these conversations. Um, and the way that this works is, is um, for uh, for any uh, category here, let's say childcare, um, we curate a, a set of very high precise terms for that topic. So we say school has a lot to do with childcare, education has a lot to do with childcare, for instance. Um, then we build a word to vec. Uh, a, a, a word embedding model on um, on the talk radio corpus, um, and then we look for um, words in the embedding that are mutually close to all of those high precision terms. So, um, so this thing, for instance, uh, it naturally uh, discovered that the phrase um, "creative writing," for instance, has a lot to do with um, uh, with, with the high precision terms that we picked for childcare. Uh, so we uh, set up these topics, um, and then uh, we can we can uh, link from this into conversations and the portions of of those conversations that people are talking about these topics. So this is a work in progress. Um, you know, I talked about the um, uh, the microphone array, but didn't, didn't actually say what we use it for. Um, the goal with the microphone array is to be able to diarize the speech. So this is to separate out voices from from the audio and transcribe them separately. Um, so uh, the Google API is really bad at doing this. Um, Rev is uh, pretty good, uh, and we count Rev as ground truth, but even still, uh, humans get things wrong. Um, so uh, um, it like, particularly happens like if in, in a very long conversation, sometimes you can tell that the transcriber is like, getting fatigued or something, and just, it just becomes more lazy like, near the end of it. Um, uh, misattributed speech is a big deal for us. Um, we allow participants to uh, retract audio, and um, most of the retractions come in two flavors. Uh, one is take out my name, which we take names out anyways, um, and the second kind of retraction was, hey, that wasn't me. So these conversations oftentimes have very um, like highly personal stories in them. Um, and if you, you know, someone is talking about like childhood trauma, and then you say, oh, this was John, but it was in fact Jack. That's a problem. Um, so, so like even if, if, um, if the accuracy is, is, uh, is 99%, if we get it wrong 1% of the time in those cases, then, um, you know, then that's not cool. 
so, so any kind of advantage that we can get to separated speakers will take. So on, on, on the left is a clustering of speakers using speaker embeddings. Um, a, uh, a, it's a method that's published by Google called dVectors. Um, and uh, I, I believe we, we use an open source package for this. And that's based off, these, off, off the frequency spectrum. And so you can see um, the labelings um, and the uh, you know and the space and the visualization the projection is kind of um, is kind of muddled. Uh, the second um, image is also stacking in information about um, time delays in uh, on the microphones um, uh, right that we can see. So uh, the um, uh, the the amount of uh, time separation between two uh, two microphones at opposite ends of the hearth is about uh, it's about one one thousandth of a of a second, I believe, um, and so you so you can see these clusters are much more distinct. So, um, so this is a thing that um, we 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 were working on this this past summer, and we'll be integrating it into the pipeline um, soon. There's a paper uh, coming out probably this academic year about these methods, and and we're hoping to also publish and maintain source code. Um, okay, so the last thing uh, of note are um, our highlights. Um, so the highlights in the system are curated by a special set of users. Um, and uh, what happens is, is that uh, these, these conversations are paused about halfway, and the facilitator will play a highlight and then ask for a, a response from, from that group. Um, and so we get a lot of like, interesting responses like this. This is a way to kind of force differing viewpoints like, into the audio. Um, and uh, the phone interface like, has a way for you to pick which highlights get synced to which hearths. Um, wh since the hearths have to, uh, to, uh, to work offline, uh, what happens is when they do go online in the libraries, they'll download all, all of the, uh, the highlights that they're supposed to have, um, and, then, uh, you know, and, and then the phone app can play them. Um, so we initially built this thing using kind of a duct tape uh, R-Sync based uh, system, but then um, af after a couple of weeks of operation, we switched to a, um, to a custom API, which gave us a lot more control about, uh, you know, unlike how the sync is done. Um, and then uh, what, what happens with the highlights is, um, so if you think about the conversations as nodes in a graph, a highlight is an edge between two nodes, and so this just forms a kind of network structure. And so we're starting to look into um, how, how these, these highlights are cross-pollinated. Um, uh, the uh, the decision to um, to uh, to share a highlight in some conversation is made by the facilitator. It's not it's not a thing that we curate. And so, with enough um, of a network and enough kind of uh, people out there doing doing this uh, you know, this kind of work, we should be able to um, discover st sort of structures in the stru structures in the network that we didn't um, think think were there. Um, but yeah, so our future work will be focused on this cross pollination, and it's 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 like the manifestation of like the kind of worldly outcome that we're trying to get, which is to actually bridge communities. Um, so where to next? Um, so can a squat wooden disc lead to better civic journalism and smarter journalism? It's kind of a uh, kind of a snarky title. It doesn't quite capture exactly what it is that we're tr trying to do um, because our, you know, our work isn't uh, centered specifically around the hearth, but it's, it's um, the, 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 the harder part of our work is actually the human network that we're trying to build. So all, all of the lab's research is, uh, is interested in the way that humans and technology kind of back and forth can augment each other. That's, 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 the, that's the origin of the name social machines. Um, and so, so, uh, so LVN is just one instance of that. Um, we're continuing to scale this out uh, by 2020. Um, hopefully we'll be nationwide just in time for the election. Um, uh, beyond 2020, I mean, the, the fantastical vision of this is that it actually creates a new kind of a civic institution. And so maybe every year you'll decide to go and give one and a half hours of your life um, to the project and talk with people in your community. Um, uh, to do this, like we need a lot of people involved. Um, there are 60 active volunteers in Madison. I think we had a wait list of something like 50 or 60 people who wanted to be trained on the device, but we didn't think that we could actually handle that kind of capacity. Um, so uh, coordinating, so that's, that's just one city. If we want to be in hundreds or possibly thousands of cities, like what we're looking at actually is the coordination of a very large um, human, uh, human network. It's, like it's more of a human problem than a technical one. Um, we are currently in the Bronx, uh, so that's in the works. Um, our Wisconsin deployment is going out into the rural areas. Um, uh, we'll be in Alabama, uh, I believe, within a couple of months, uh, probably in Arizona in a few months as well. Um, so yeah, 
that's, uh, that's a talk. Um, if you have any questions, um, I'll take both technical and non-technical questions. Thanks. So I'm curious, who, um, who thinks that this is a good idea? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. It's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's been an interesting uh, human scale problem. Um, we get a lot of excitement over it, um, uh, but it's also hard to get people to come in to actually have conversations. So. Yep. Yeah, the, the, it's so. Uh, it's, uh, it's, so the question is: is the, mo is, is, is the motivation from this from the previous election? Um, it's definitely it's a thing that's that's like on the back of our minds, but it's not really um, it's it's not a thing that we talk about constantly. Um, we'd like for it to be a more general purpose civic tool that um, it's not specifically to to like um, deal with politics, but it's also to get different communities uh, talking to each other and different communities. Um, um, like we'd like for them to be able to empathize. Um, and so we are, you know, our kind of uh, hypothesis, I think we call it a theory, our, you know, our theory of social change, right, is that it's easier for that to happen in person than it is um, at scale, like through Facebook or Twitter. Right, some questions here? Yep. What's the relationship between the um, research, into, or the, the studying of talk radio uh, okay, uh, so that's a good question. Okay, so what's what's a, what's what's the relationship between the study of the talk radio data and LVN? Um, there isn't really a direct relationship aside from um, the fact that many of the same engineers and researchers are involved. Um, the talk radio thing was much more of a um, it started off much more as like a purely academic kind of a pursuit, right? Which is that there is, uh, as, as far as we know, like nobody is storing. Um, or analyzing uh, that amount of talk radio data. Um, like we think it's the largest corpus that has ever existed by probably several orders of magnitude. Um, so um, so as, as like sort of computational social scientists, it's actually it's a great uh, set of data to have. Um, uh, and uh, Cortico, part of the reason for Cortico um, uh, when it was first built was, was to really productionize and run that talk radio system. Uh, the productionizing of it, a thing that, um, you know, is a thing that grad students shouldn't really be spending their time on. Um, and then just naturally from there, the sort of focus on the transcription and the speech work kind of made its way into, um, into our designs for LVN. Yeah. How do you recognize the bias? Uh, how do we recognize the, the uh, the conversational bias. Oh, um, well, so we don't really uh, calculate a measure of bias. Um, we have that, uh, that measure of um, sort of uh, complexity of the language. But this is, you know, this is more like a measure of just, just, just like, uh, like how many different topics are people talking about. But we currently don't really do anything about, um, you know, about bias. So, um, there is, uh, so in, in some instances with, uh, with cross-pollination, um, we found that uh, different conversations, different groups of people have very different perspectives on the same thing. Um, so we have the beginnings, right? So you know, you know, like we know, oh, hey, this highlight from this conversation was pollinated into this conversation. So we have that link. And so we do have the beginnings of a way to kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say like pick out bias, but um, more like, um, you know, like accentuate different perspectives on the same thing. Um, but we're, we're, we're still working on that. No, yeah, yeah, so the question is, do we have any kind of noise reduction mechanism? Um, the range compression, um, uh, does reasonably well to sort of deaccentuate um, uh, white noise, um, but if there are a lot of people talking in the background, then that is an issue. Um, and uh, we, we we have had problems where um, people bring the hearts into um, you know into like a restaurant or a bar. We actually had conversations occur in a bar, and there it's like even the human transcribers have have problems. Um, so I don't know if this is a thing that we'll actually be able to really properly um, solve. Uh, 
But, you know, we do put guidelines in, like um, we ask that people don't stand up and walk around, for instance, which makes the, uh, the sort of clustering and the location of, uh, like using the microphone array to, right, to locate one voice. If, it's, if we can make the assumption that it's not moving around, that actually makes things much easier. Um, but yeah, we still, there's uh, one conversation that I, I frequently work with that, uh, that um, uh, there's a dog in the conversation and it starts barking and it just like, I mean, it does like crazy things to the audio um, and then like it barks a couple of times while people are talking and then someone like stands up, walks the dog out of the room and like slams the door shut. So it's like all sorts of like stuff, stuff that, um, you know, are probably uh, not typical inputs into, you know, into speech systems. Uh, okay, so that's a that's a great question. Okay, so the question is, um, uh, you know, as this expands nationally, can we use this to map the progression of possibly fake news? Um, well, it, so the fake the fake part of it, I don't know. I, I'm you know I'm I'm honestly not sure if if um, fakeness is you know really a thing that as um, computational social scientists we should we can like really effectively tackle. Um, the mapping of, of the, the movement of ideas is definitely a thing that we've talked about in the lab. Um, and there's another form of this actually. One of the, uh, of the outputs of the talk radio research actually is how um, uh, we, can, we can map the transmission of ideas on Twitter um, to talk radio and back. Um, that is uh, not very precise because um, we don't have a good, good measure, for instance, of, of um, uh, well, okay, so with tweets, uh, a small percentage of tweets are actually geolocated, so we actually don't know where a lot of tweets are. We can infer from social graphs what the location of someone might be, but, you know, that's, that's not, you know, it's, it's not always correct. Um, the second thing is that we have the broadcast ranges of, of, of the radio stations. Um, we don't really know if, like, someone is actually has the, has the radio turned on and has heard it or not. So it's, 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 a, very, it's a very imprecise thing, but that was, that, that was the idea with the research, was to be able to track the progression of um, some particular idea you know, through the network. Um, and that, that came out of uh, previous research in the lab that actually looked at fake news, that, you know, news that was debunked and how it spread um, purely on Twitter. So, so I think I'm out of time. Um, all right, thanks. <laughs>